every sailor's favorite reason for visiting Japan. Now meet the lady who portrayed her, Miss Donna Mahini. Yes. 
rentable, rentable. Uh, Digital Man is now out in the uh, blockbuster. Corny, corny slick, but hey. Uh, and another one that's coming out called Finding Interest. It's uh, with Chris Penn and uh, Tim Quill, who's on Jack, and Anna Belisario. And uh, so that is coming out soon. Who's waving? Hello. <laughs> Uh, this is the third rock from the sun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't normally get to do those half-hour comedies. So I had a good time, and uh, I think we'll be recurring, so that'll be nice. Oh, good. Really wonderful. Uh, lady on the show, Christine, Kristen Johnston. And it's funny, because last year I was uh, attending a play that a friend of mine was in, and I saw this gal on the play, and she was really talented, and I circled the name, and I said, I must work with this girl someday. And I play her love interest in this show. <laughs> That's fun. And um, yeah, I was a real, a real kid this past week we taped it, and I guess it'll be on within about three or four weeks. I got to work with John with yeah, he's, he's a great, very gracious. Looking forward to uh, a few more of those. So, that's, that's the beginning. The, the work that begins for the season. Ryan is in school now. <laughs> He's a sophomore in high school. Nice. Yeah. Right. Brad, what's that? Try to keep up my grades to new job. <laughs> He's going to an all boys school. Unfortunately. Oh. <laughs> it's a penitentiary, I'm not sure if it's <laughs> And Bradley, what year of school are you in now? I'm not I am not in school. Right now, I have a paying job at LA Law, which is a just private organization for the uh, developmentally disabled. I am an artisan, and I sew, and I get paid four fifty an hour. All right. Do you have to? Give a percentage to your manager and agent. The driver gets to the driver. The Okay. This is very hard for me, you guys, but I lost my father. Aww. Yes. I wanted to bring the news to all of you guys. I know some of you might have remembered my father from the past. Quantum Leap convention, you know, as I was coming earlier. So I thought I would be able to break the news. He uh, passed away. He had a heart attack back to back. So, you know, it's a real loss for me. Uh, how many of you knew Brad Stan Harold? of you might want to answer too. Um, I'm interested in your writing career and what you're doing with that now, and if others of you have interest in writing and, and in what way. Okay. Um, we have a, a project that we're trying to push uh, I have a partner on called Hard Luck Cowboys. Is that... <laughs> Thank you. 
And it's funny, uh, last year I checked out for a while, I went to NYU to directing school in the summertime. Yes! And uh, it was something that I had been wanting to do for a long time. And so you, it's great, because I decided to go to New York, because this way the phone wouldn't ring over there, and I wouldn't have to be obliged to, to go on auditions and things, because if you're in town, it's going to be that pressure to do that. Um, and that was terrific. You sort of, as an actor on the set, you don't, I guess you don't really get a grasp for how much you know of what takes place behind the camera. Then, then when I got there, I, you know, I was I was reassured. But I um, made a short film over the summer that I wrote. It's sort of a long, grueling uh, course. You're up till two thirty, three in the morning, typing at your computer, trying to get the product done. And after that, I had intended to move a little quicker with Hard Luck Cowboys, but fortunately, work has been very good. Uh, acting wise, and um, I actually went back and did a sequest um, right after. Uh, in fact, I had to miss the post on my own film because uh, it was taking place in Florida, and I, I got there just in time for the hurricane, which was which was nice. <laughs> and uh, I was down in South Florida visiting my parents, and they 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 shoot in Orlando. And the hurricane was literally going between Fort Lauderdale and Orlando. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? And they said, well, we'll drive back. <laughs> through the hurricane. And I thought, this must be sequest. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm going to try and concentrate. I have a few things that I've been playing with. I just went to the um, Sundance Festival with my first time. Oh. And uh, I wanted to sort of get an idea of what happens there and how to go about bringing a film there. So hopefully in the not too distant future we can do that. <laughs> That's my writing now. It'll, it'll be on hold until probably mid-April until the final season's over and then it'll kick in. It's just there's too many things to memorize. Did anybody else have any writing projects that we should be aware of? <laughs> you, know, you got a school paper you're writing. Right? <laughs> there you go. Are you guys writing? Do you have anything from your diary you want to read? John, I'm sorry, Christy. It's really great to see you out here. Thank you. And I have a question for Giovanni. Um, I didn't realize that you played both the bartender in the Vietnam episode and the Lily Harvey Oswald. And I was wondering which one of those you had uh, more fun than the other Which one was prettier? <laughs> Uh, actually, I have fun with both of them, and uh, the thing is, I'm very grateful to uh, Don Belisario because uh, he pulled me into both of them after I did uh, Tequila Bonetti, and uh, of course I was uh, a cross-dresser there too, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> but uh, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed all of it, it's a lot of fun, yeah. Um, you know, when you get somebody to back you up like that, it's always pretty. Because it's very, it's very rare because as actors, we're always like auditioning, you know, and sometimes we're saying, please. <laughs> and uh, when somebody sees confidence in you and uh, stuff like that, it always makes it better. So thanks, yeah. John, thank you for coming in here. Oh. Could you tell us when the third round, the sub is going to have your... Yes. I don't have an air date. I would, I would imagine in the next three or four weeks. Yeah, well, lots of fun there. Thank you. Thank you. I told Mr. Lindsay how it would work. I said we have a very supportive crowd. Quite pleased. They're doing very good. The numbers on that show are... Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 It's the same writers of Wayne Girl, Alan Hayes, they're from Saturday Night Live. It's a very nice people. Hi, Ronnie. My husband is A little louder, please. Can you hear me? No. I just wanted to know how is it working with Scott on GoCo. I love your character. Aren't you on Gung Ho? Gung Ho. How is it working with Gung Ho? When you get older, the ears go. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It was great. Um, yeah, that was, that was one of our earlier projects together. And so at that particular time, we were all growing, you know. And so, you know, we were all experimenting constantly, you know, with that dialogue, with uh, whatever have you. But 
God, that's, God is, is unbelievable. You know, he's, he's such a giving person. And, uh, you know, it's like feeling one-on-one, -on -one, you know? Like, it's John here, I, I'm, I'm sure it's the same, I know it's the same way, you know? You give to your partner so that they give back to you so the scene becomes a much better scene. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. You got great people to talk to. <laughs> And I will, I will confess something. When I first met Bradley on the, uh, on the set, this is, this, is, this is a selfish part of all actors that are, we just observe behavior. <laughs> Somebody touching themselves or anything? I can't, but I can't. <laughs> Are we getting feedback? Yeah. 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 Suzanne, you're never going to work in this town again. <laughs> but I was going to say that the um, my, I have to have a relationship with a Down syndrome brother. And I've got all of what hours to have a relationship occur and make it look like I've known this person forever. And in this case, you know, Bradley's on the set with his mom and dad were with us that day. And uh, Ryan is there and we had this family forming. And Olivia played my, my wife, Laura, and it was wonderful. Um, but there's a part of me that says, oh, if I get very close to Bradley, it's going to help me in the role. Because that's what we do. We have to just immerse ourselves. And that's the honest truth. Little did I know <laughs> how close we would get through time. And um, it's, been, you know, it's been a real delight for me. It, it's interesting because it really did start out as a selfish notion, a selfish acting notion. Um, and it's been everything but that since. I wanted to add on, if I may, I've known my brother John for quite a while. I don't know how long, but of all the episodes I've done, I've enjoyed being with brother John. He was very good to me and close. And not only that, then when I start to know Karen, you know, it, it's just like, being close to another person in my life that I know. And it's really nice, the fact that I have people that I do love now, because I know what my father said to me. My father said to me, go on son, lead your life, but just remember to follow what other people do. That is what I'm trying to do right now. And it's very hard for me to uh, realize, I asked myself this morning a question. Why is God so very powerful? Why does God take away the ones we love? And I did not get an answer. I wish someone had an answer for that prayer. Sometimes he replaces them with hundreds more. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a question out here. I did a Baywatch 
But uh, actually, well, I don't know. It was false. Okay. Um, I met David's wife, Pamela, at a promotional that we did in uh, North Carolina. Where's Wilmington? North Carolina. And uh, we had a really great time, and then afterwards I, I met David, and um, so we all got to be friendly, so I ended up doing an episode of that show. I had a good time. Actually, I, I liked the storyline because it, it, was good. it was really about, it wasn't a fluffy storyline, it was a father who had not been taking enough attention with his son. And uh, that, that was a, a really nice, nice break. Brian? Uh, I have a son that's your age. What are your interests like? Do you like certain kinds of music or? Oh yeah. Um, do you do sports in school or what? Um, yeah, I play golf in school. Good. And, yeah, and then uh, in school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're disruptive. <laughs> no, um, I play golf, and then uh, I, I'm also heavily into snowboarding. I like that a lot. I go pretty much every weekend if I can. If there's snow. And, uh, How far do you live from the mountain? Uh, well, approximately like 45 minutes. Like so I go up there a lot. Um, <coughs> do a lot of water sports in the summer or whatever. You know, Brandon and I are downhill racers. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> Not by choice. It's just like <laughs> Brandon wears one of those hats that they have on the slopes now, they kind of like pop their suits. Well, anyway, <laughs> what we're talking about this morning, when we were coming, driving up the hotel, Johnny said to this lady, uh, are you going to move the cones or are we going to move the cone heads? <laughs> and that humor really works well at the Indianapolis convention. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. When you guys were deciding your careers, was there any special actor, actress, or teacher that led you to go into the business of acting? at the uh, Paris Opera House in Paris, and I went to Italy for a while, and uh, went on this fluke audition, never even knew anything about acting, didn't know what a s script was, didn't know anything, and I auditioned, and uh, got that role, and uh, went over to Africa for a month, uh, doing Last Temptation of Christ, I don't know if you saw that, um, and that was my first experience with Barbara Hershey and Roland Defoe, and, Mark Scorsese and all incredible pros, and that was when I got hooked with the pros. And uh, from then on, I just uh, started pursuing it slowly. I still didn't know anything about it, but you know, it was so far out there. And dancing was that's all I did was dance, eight hours a day, seven days a week. And to be an actor, I thought, oh, you have to be some freak theater person, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you a question. I worked with uh, I worked with a dancer once who I thought was a brilliant actress. But how does that help you in the acting world? Does it free your body in such a way that you feel more comfortable? It's too much. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I've been told that I'm too free in the offices when I go in there. You know, I'm on a desk. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh. Yeah. Uh, well, it's okay. You can just sit back and crush on it. Um, I've never gotten a chance to put my dance in my acting until now, which is going to um, open, I think, March 6th at the Roxy. Um, Lou Adler, who did the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Did anybody see that? Um, He's doing a new play, and, and I get to dance a lot, and, it, and it's a really incredible um, 
I did three. Bradley did. I did four. I did the last episode. I did the last one too, but you did another one. Which was the one you did without me? Shock theater. Shock theater. Shock theater. Shock theater. Shock theater. Mm. Uh, so another question I saw a light go up. What is the sound though? Uh, Bradley. Brad? Brad has a question for you. Oh. I'm just curious. Um, are you involved with special limits or anything like that? Uh, with the with the California, because Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of helped involve with Special Olympics with the um, yeah. special people in the state. And I was wondering if you were involved with it in any way or would like to get involved and stuff like that. Okay, I have not been in any Special Olympics. Um, I know my, when Michael Landon was alive, I did a uh, thing with Michael Landon. I played the planet for him at that, at that uh, special thing at the Beverly Hills. Otherwise, um, yes, I would like to get back into the Special Olympics again. I think it would be a good cause. Ryan, I have one question for you. Yes. What is your schoolmate's reaction to um, your TV appearances and the conventions and all that other stuff, how you recognize, what do they think of your popularity? Are you popular with the girls or outside? <laughs> 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 school. Hey, it's it. It's an all boys school. So. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want them to be too popular. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, just the, the kids or um, kids. Yeah. Uh, um, not too many people really know. Uh, just like most, most of my closer friends and stuff like that, they all know. And, you know, they think it's really cool and everything like that. And um, you seem, this is interesting because you're an actor, you seem a little bit shy as well. Am I right? Oh, just the Don't be shy. Okay. So you exercise. I'm here with you. Do you exercise sort of that need to be seen when you work and you know, that, that satisfies all of that? Basically, I'm just asking ridiculous questions. <laughs> <laughs> I did a Baywatch. Did anyone do that? Baywatch, yeah. This is a question for all the actors. Uh, let's see if I can explain it from over here. Hi. Right. Uh, let's see if I can explain this. Um, because of the, the way the show is made, you're actually acting to somebody who's portraying somebody else. You have to pretend, right, that, you know, you're looking at Scott, you're acting in front of Scott, but you're thinking, okay, it's really somebody else. Now, I don't know, is there, you know, did you have to keep that in your mind all the time? Was there a trick you did, or did you not care? You just acted knowing it was, you know, Scott, or thinking it was Sam, or thinking it was a different character? It's a good question for Ryan, actually. Because he has that lovely bedtime story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I just pretty much acted like it was just Scott. I can't really remember it too well. It was a long time ago. <laughs> Did you do a lot of drugs in between? <laughs> 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 Don't judge, bro. Don't judge, bro. Good question. Good. That's a good question. It was very confusing for me because I had to play Russian, Japanese, in another time era with Scott. Never seen the show. Didn't know who he was playing. It all happened too fast. <laughs> I got a call the night before. <laughs> I had no idea. I had a Russian tape next to my wow. bed. Nobody coached me. I was begging. I would pay any amount of money for them to coach me in Russian. Because I do speak some Japanese. I lived there for a year. And so I already had that, you know, a little in me. Uh, I showed up and I had to do the Russian. and. Of course, Donald stuffed me to a D, you know, and that was in my balance off a little bit. Donald, all right, more. <laughs> you know what's fun? You should, unfortunately, I, I brought a, a tape for Donald because she doesn't have a tape. These are outtakes. Oh. I mean, she didn't have hers, you know. But she, you know, there's this, in our episode, I think you guys saw it, where, where she comes up to Patty and grabs her and throws her on the floor and she's starting to talk Japanese. <laughs> A couple times she goes, Come to the heck? I go, no, no, it's this. And so the second time she goes, <laughs> I'm 
please. <laughs> and then the next time she goes, why did you let him touch you? Why did I touch you? You know, perfect Russian accent, right? She could do Japanese. But I know the Japanese. <laughs> Well, I tell you, these, the poor girls, they were black and blue because we did this part for about a week. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and some of the outtakes, it shows, you know, they're, they're dropping to the floor, and all of a sudden, uh, the, the skirts hike up, and you see knee pads. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. All these little things when you have to And the, the breast pads that get falling out. Scott, I'm like, Scott, just oh. hold them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do you do it? Yeah. that she was doing, you have to pick them up. I had to pick up Patty. He picked up her Donna. Well, he picks her up like this. <laughs> her up. And she's crazy, right? She's struggling and he's holding on like this. <laughs> like saying, I'm going to fall, I'm going to fall. We bonded. <laughs> After that, we kissed up here. We bonded on the, the breastplate. <laughs> The Jimmy episodes, because I felt that it was... On Laverne and Shirley, not this one. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the Jimmy episode, because I felt that that was a, that was a great excellence, because I get residuals every time. <laughs> So 
Yeah, and I, I think it's, you leave here and you realize it's not that important. There are other people having other lives out there. And I came back and I was discussing with a friend of mine who had been mistreated at her job. I said, you know, you can't, you can't allow that. You have to have your integrity. You have to insist on whatever. And as I'm saying these words, in walks the producer of Sequest and sits right there. And I looked at her and I said, now it's my turn. And he walked over to the table. Am I bothering you? <laughs> <laughs> we can give you this microphone. You want to forget about that one? Why don't we all take our clothes off? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, I'm gonna try, I'll condense this story in that we had a bit of a, an encounter at this restaurant that was bordering on the bazaar. And months later, um, when I was in New York, my manager called me and said, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? Because a letter just arrived at the William Morris Agency, a complete apology and vindication <coughs> for what took place uh, at the end of the first season. She read the letter to me and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And it was accompanied with a script uh, for Krieg's Return. And it was interesting because this particular producer, who I felt the most distance from of anybody in this city, um, not only apologized and had the, the, the moral character to do that, but he also wrote, wrote my return in the third season and uh, I learned that you know, a lot more about the gray area because there are a lot of people after Sequest who I did help a lot. Um, <laughs> who I never heard from again. And I think I'm going to cut the story short. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> the other thing, uh, yeah, one, one thing. The other thing that, that is very important, and this kind of situation is very rare, but we do, as actors, do depend on you to, you know, when you like somebody or like an episode or you find, you see an injustice, it really helps to write in, you know, as you keep saying over and over, you know, and, and, and it makes people more aware, you know, like the powers to be, that, oh, maybe we goofed up or something, you know, so whatever you see, and if you like, please, you know, do a lot of writing in. You're saving our careers. <laughs> <laughs> right. We already asked him to do that quantum We're still fighting for that, so yeah. they cast a thousand. <laughs> oh, here, Rodney. Oh, hi. Including you. Yeah, what? Including you. You can be in the quantum wig movie. We're still fighting for that. Oh, good. We're still writing. Um, all we have to now to do is take one more question. Then uh, many of these folks are going to be signing autographs for us, so everybody should know where to go by now. And if we could ask our five actors before you leave the stage to please sign the cardboard platform to your right. Before you leave, Brad, wait, Brad, wait, Brad, sit down. <laughs> uh, but we're going to ask one more question, and then you can do this, and then please autograph that. We're going to auction it tomorrow in our charity oh, auction. No That's just a warning that for, for all you five. And we have one more question, okay? I just wonder if they shot the worst scene in the, the warehouse scene. Where was that shot? San Pedro. San Pedro? Yeah, San Pedro. It has the same, uh, same locations for the, uh, the sequel to Jimmy as well, for the rest of the movie. Okay. Thank you very much.
the boy Jaguar, which also quell. Uh, I'm getting ready to do some independent film 
work as the writer, director, producer, caterer. <laughs> Doing a lot of doing a lot of directing uh, theater mostly. Um, <laughs> I haven't been doing very much work on television, but um, hopefully, hopefully you'll see me beating up some more white people. This <laughs> They, they wanted me for uh, the O.J. Simpson story, <laughs> and uh, the musical, uh, I'm available. So. <laughs> there are a lot of scenes in Folsom Prison. Oh, 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 I'll be tiny, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and once they figure out whether O.J. was chipping golf balls or napping or taking a shower or whatever, the, they got to work that out. I think OJ and the Menendez brothers. OJ and the Menendez brothers and Rick James. They talk to <laughs> But the name Billy and the Beaters is already taken. So. <laughs>
different projects where the writing is not necessarily the best. Um, but we do it because we all have mortgages. Um, I say I spend about maybe 15 days out of a month in front of the computer. So that's a lot of time. I've been writing since uh, on this particular script since last July. I went to Nashville to do some research. I do a lot, little writing every day with my partner, Rod. We wrote a script for CBS a couple of years ago, which was a remake of the movie Bullet, Bullet 2. And now we're, we're on this. So uh, it's different working with a partner than it is working writing by yourself. What we do is uh, we write things and fax them back and forth to each other. Uh, we rewrite each other's pages. I mean, it's really great. If you have a modem now, you can do all kinds of things together. And uh, you can really have a good free flow of ideas. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll give you my email address. If you <laughs> That's the 90s for you. Everybody has an email address. Um, but it, writing is, is something that's, I think, very near and dear to every actor because, uh, as you said, we all get to uh, uh, deal with writing that's not always so superb or spectacular. It's written by uh, committees of people. And Hollywood has been notorious for taking great writers like F. Scott Fitzgerald and Hemingway, bringing them out to California, giving them a lot of money, and then changing everything they wrote. So uh, I think when actors have downtime, very often a lot of us turn to, to writing because we know the importance of it, and, and it's another creative expression. I think it also keeps you close to, to what you like to do. You know, um, there are those few times in an actor's career uh, when, you get a, when you get a script that you really love, I mean, that you go home and you can't wait to, to get back the next day to work. That happened with us on uh, Black and White on Fire uh, with uh, Deborah Pratt. I mean, um, the script was so great that you would go home, and I would go home at night and, and read, and just read, and just read, and, and be ready to come back and go to work the next day. That doesn't happen all the time. So writing is, writing is real cool to do in front of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else have a question? Oh, I, don't I don't have a question. <laughs> yeah, what the hell's the question? No, um, as, as far as me writing, this is like, the, this is the first thing I've ever really tried to write as far as the screenplay goes, aside from the thing that called it. And um, uh, I don't, <laughs> I don't I, I'm just finding out how much I don't know. You know, I'm kind of, discovering it as I go, and, and writing for me lately has been, uh, if, I, if I sit and say, okay, I'm going to write now, this is nothing. But if, if I just go about my day and then I just go, oh, all of a sudden, the muse will start, to, I'll, I'll just start hearing conversations in my head, and rather than check into an <laughs> asylum or something, I sit down and start writing. And, uh, and sometimes I'm there for hours, and hours, and hours, and hours, just I forget who said this, but some, some great writer once said that writing was easy. All you got to do was stare at a blank piece of paper until pools of blood. Oh, it's a computer screen. <laughs> it's a computer screen now. Yeah, but it's not my house. <laughs> Does anybody know what this is, by the way? No. Uh -huh. Okay, next question. <laughs> I'm, I'm explaining to you what the computer Who's doing that? Say that again? I'd like to thank you all for your contributions to Quantum Leap, and I would also like to say thank you to Mike for his contributions to ER, and everyone Dash is here, thank you too. Mike, when are we going to see you on ER again? <laughs> Probably sometime before the season is over. I've been on twice this season, and uh, the character has become important enough where they now talk about me when I'm not yes. there. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Someone else? Why are you an inquisitive punch on? There's a lovely hand in the back. You don't know what this is. What Think is about it? it. Has it been quantum leap? It's just yes. a film while she's getting punched. I wish I'd brought my accordion. I can't see it very well. This is the person from Marcus University. 
Um, do you have any relations that maybe um, post production in any movies, any on um, TV shows or anything? I'm sorry, any relations what? Uh, relations in any um, of the TV shows and maybe post production behind the scenes? No. You don't? No. No, no, that's you're not talking about that. Michael, One person that you might be talking about is Cosmo Genetics. Yes. Cosmo, I remember when my sister and I were growing up in uh, St. Louis, Granite City, Illinois, we used to go bonkers at the end of uh, uh, The Lawyer Guy. Perry Mason? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the guys at the end of Perry Mason would always be Cosmo Genetics' name, and he was the script coordinator. When I first came out here in 1982, the first job I had was McLean's Law, and he was the script coordinator on that. And I was just, wow! <laughs> but no, we're not related. <laughs> Down in front. Did you hear of Mita Rosenberg's, uh, uh, Stuart Rosenberg, Roy Huggins, you know, those people? Oh, yes. I'm not related yes. to them. <laughs> Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. <laughs> uh, hi, this question is for James Handy. Um, you did a very intensive part on Quantum Leap when you were doing the part on the roof with Tamlin Tony. Yes, right. It was a very good part. Uh, I was wondering how long it took for you to rehearse that part, plus the part supposedly you were hanging over the side of the building. I'm always interested in what goes on behind the scenes. Well, they actually built a, a platform below me um, on the side of the building, and there were two uh, guys waiting there to catch me. Uh, not that it was a big drop, but they were, they were holding my legs, and that scene where Scott was holding my jacket and it slid off and I went down. So there were two guys beneath me there on the platform. We were way up, and it was, it was some old uh, brewery that was no longer in use in uh, Van Nuys. So it was pretty, you know, probably up about 12 stories, I guess, something like that. But, um, we were running through, uh, behind in that show, time-wise, too. I was supposed to kill a lot more people on that episode. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we ran out of time, so I couldn't kill as many as I was supposed to, so they had to change it. You know? I was kind of disappointed because I was having fun. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, when, when you were throwing her down on yeah. the roof, yeah. No, she really wasn't, no. Yeah, they, uh, she was great, no. She, she, we, you know, we choreographed it and did it so it looked real, but, but uh, nobody got hurt, no. Yeah. out at Warner Brothers a few years earlier. And Michael's somebody that I really like, and, and Deborah Pratt was, was there as well. And Michael and I know Deborah from St. Louis, where Mikey and I, sorry, Mike and I. <laughs> I know him a long time. <laughs> Mike, uh, you can call me Mike. <laughs> Mike and I first worked together in 1969, so we, we know each other a long time. And, uh, uh, Deborah told me about, about the part as well. And when I read it, I just found it particularly moving. And I found that, oddly enough, I didn't have to do anything about it. Scott is such a wonderful actor and such a wonderful presence to work with that he just, you know, I, I kind of wondered what it was going to be like because you know, he walks on the set in a dress and earrings <laughs> and makeup, you know, and this is a serious episode. And I thought, this could be a little humorous and, and difficult. But he showed up and he was right there. You know, I mean, he comes in, didn't, didn't fool around at all. It was perfectly, he was that character. And for me, the only natural thing for me to do was to treat him as if he were my daughter. And I remember when I watched the, uh, the episode the first time, and I think that was the clip you saw today where I was standing behind him and I had my arms around him. And, and I was talking to him. I looked at that thing and I said, 
it, it was unbelievable to me that, that it was so easy to do. It was so easy for me to believe it. Uh, and, I, and I give a lot of credit to, uh, to Scott for that. I mean, he just, he did a wonderful job in that script. I know a lot of, in, in that particular episode, a lot of people found that one moving. It was a lady who was here last year who said that she found a particular catharsis in her own life from that story. And uh, really, uh, I give all the credit to them. I thought it was very well written. Uh, Michael Zinberg directed it very well, and Scott made it so easy for me. So easy <laughs> to do my job. Uh, so I just showed up in that one. I thought they were, they were all wonderful. I hope that answers your question. I don't know if that the green lady. This is for Sami. Um, have you found in going out for jobs and so on that things are getting any better for a range of possible roles for you? Or do you think that there is no discernible movement? How we get to the heavy stuff? Well, I was having an audition for a one-legged black guy. I was up for that. Um. <laughs> I'll tell you, that, that, that's a very good question. I, I, the only way I can answer that is I have a, a, a personal problem with, with the way some of with the ways television shows America. I mean, it it it, it boggles my mind that a show like and I don't want to like ruffle any feathers, but it bothers it bothers me a lot that a show like Friends which takes place in New York City, uh, has no Latinos, and has no Asians, and, and has no black people, because I don't know if you've been to New York City lately. <laughs> you know what I mean? It bothers me that Jerry Seinfeld doesn't really have, and, and these are supposed to be like, you're a hip, this new hip America. And if that's our new hip America, then I think we're in trouble on that front. Um, you know, as a, yeah, you know, as, as an actor, as, as a person just in the business, I'd like to see more women behind the camera. I'd like to see more people of color behind the camera. Yeah. I'd like to see, you know, um, it's, it's, import, it's important that that happens because the more we show, the more Hollywood shows a greater diversity and of, of, of what this country is about, the better off I think this country will be and we won't have what we had a couple of years back in LA or what we've had in DC or what we've had in New York because people can look at the screen and say, oh, that's me. You know, no, I mean, a, a, a male director can direct, can direct a group of females and say, this is how I want you to be. And it can be done very well. But a female director can look at those same women and say, what would take me five minutes could take her five seconds by just saying, you know that thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it just happens. So, so yeah, it, it's hard. And has it gotten any better? Not really. It's um, it's gotten it's gotten safe. And people like Mike and you know my friends here. I mean, we come we come from a generation of people, particularly like out of Chicago, where you got your job based on whether you could do it or not. I mean. There were times that we see like Misha Taylor, who was on, on Dave's World, play everything from an Israeli to, uh, uh, um, you, know, uh, you know, I mean anything. Not because that's who he was, but because he was a good enough actor to do the job. And the closer we can get to that, the better off the whole country or the whole planet. Uh, yeah, this one's for Tommy. Yes. Um, if you were asked to do another Quantum Leap episode, would you do it and why? I would do it in a heartbeat because I, I, you know, as actors, we don't, there's very seldom that you get a chance to like the people that you're working with. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I mean, really. 
I came, I came to Quantum Leap, I had a, a bit of an edge, you know, because I've known Deborah Pratt for, for years. I mean, we were like teenagers together back in Chicago. Um, the bonus was being able to, to come on the set and work with unbelievably amazing actors, led by Scott Bakley, who I still think today got robbed by not being an Emmy. Anytime you have an actor that comes on stage, that, that comes on the set week in and week out as somebody different and keeping the intensity and still not being a star, darling, is, is amazing. You know, I, I, when, when my episode was over, I was the only quote unquote militant that was left standing. <laughs> So, so I called up Deborah like the next day and said, look, I got this great idea. Why don't we have Sam like, you know, like leap until like 1990, well, when was the riots here? 1992? Why don't we have him leap into 1992 and run into this character? What is this character doing now in 1990? I thought it would have been a great, I thought it would have been a great episode. But CBS had a different plan. Yeah, I would do. I would do one in a heartbeat. I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, while you're while the green lady's moving, uh, <laughs> Mike talked about uh, back in back in the Midwest, and Mike and I worked at a repertory theater in St. Louis, and we also part time taught in a theater department. And Deborah Pratt was our student uh, back when she was a young gal, and I remember when I when I came out to California and I ran into her. We had lunch one day. She wanted to tell me about this. Uh, Thing that, that she and Don were working on, and it was Quantum Leap. And we're having lunch, and she said, well, there's this kind of time travel thing that's going on. And she said, I can't really explain it, because I don't really understand it. But it's like being slingshotted through time somehow. And it makes sense to Don. She said, but I'm going to get to write some really good stuff in the air. And she was telling me about Scott Bakula, who you talked about. And absolutely, it's incredible to me as well, because if that's not acting, you know, if that's not award-worthy, what is? Because, uh, you know, it, it's definitely difficult to do a show anyway, and to keep a character sustained throughout season after season. But to also keep a character sustained and create another one every week is absolutely outrageous. I think Scott got beat out that year by Flip Wilson. By the way, that was a theoretical question if he would do another one because you don't talk to him. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, Green Lady. Hi, uh, this question is for Michael. You do a lot of that. You do two accents on the show, Italian and then the Irish. Do they come easy? I'm just going to ask you, do they come easy? Do you get a lot of them? And also, where's the hat from last year? Yeah. <laughs> well, the hat's at home. I decided not to wear it again. I had it re-blocked, and it was starting to crack on the front. So they re-blocked it and turned it around, and now the brim is, I mean, the, uh, the point is on the back side, but it's still there. It's sitting on the trombone at home. I don't play the trombone, but it looks good. <laughs> I walk into that room and go, damn. <laughs> as far as accents go, uh... <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it was supposed to be a Welsh dialect. <laughs> Mike was known as the dialect man. Many seasons of bread with him, and, and uh, it was the dialect doctor's name. And Robert Easton. Mike taught Robert Easton everything he knows about teaching dialect. I once, I once did a movie called Eyes of Fire, and I had to prepare for it like the night before, and I had to have a French accent. And the best thing we could come up with was. Wait, I'll think about this one. <laughs> what was it, Ellen? 
<laughs> what? It's an actor's name. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. oh that actor. <laughs> Peter Sellers. Anyway. <laughs> the image. The image. The image was this actor, and doing a French dialect, and the best I could come up with was this actor doing Pepe Le Pew. <laughs> and I got the role. Uh, I learned dialects. They go in my ear and they sort of digest and they come out and they sort of sound like what I think they sound like that. And uh, yeah, Arthur's like one of my big distractors when it comes to dialects. He's always on my case. And, but mostly when I have a dialect, I depend on Ellen to like, you know, get me moving in the right direction. Thank you. I have a question. Um, Belisario wanted to do that role in the first place. <laughs> and decided that instead of him doing it, I should do it. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question is for all of you, if you take a turn at it. Who in your career has given you the best advice and what was it? <laughs> Where we started kissing. I was be quiet. I was laughing. I'm going to say Michael, you're funny. Um, I don't know. Uh, someone said get out. Of course, that was my mom. Um, oh, God. When I was in graduate school at UC Irvine, uh, there, was, there were a couple of uh, actors from Hungary who came and, and uh, and talk to us, and I had the habit then of getting on stage, saying what I what I had to do, doing what I had to do really quick, and getting the hell out of there because I was just freaking out inside, you know, kind of nervousness. And uh, my Lisa Martin was her name, and she said, "You have to have the courage to take your time." <laughs> and that was that was a big. That was a good dialect. <laughs> Like generic Eastern European. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Why else do it better than you? Finally, thank you, Alan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Um, when I was a sophomore in high school, um, my what then became my mentor. Told me that the best thing that I could do as an actor was not to get caught at it. <laughs> and I didn't understand that until I became a junior in high school <laughs> and got caught at it. Um, um, Marilyn Hessel Shields was, was, was a wonderful, wonderful, uh, was a wonderful teacher for me. That's what she told me: never get caught at acting. And she told me the best way to not get caught was to really enjoy it, not play at it. So, wherever you are, Marilyn, thank you. Yeah, what has you? Proviso is the same school that Dennis promised to uh, When I was 17 years old, I was an apprentice in Summerstock in New Hampshire, and I had a wonderful acting teacher named Jerome Dempsey who played Glad Hand in West Side Story on Broadway. And he, wonderful character actor. And I, I guess I sort of was reminded him of himself when he was younger. And that summer in, in Summerstock, I took uh, an acting class with him. And every week he made me do a different character that I would never, ever play, ever. The first week I had to do Sakini in Tea House of the August Moon. I mean, and, and, every, and I would say to him, Mr. Dempsey, why, why, why are you making me do all this stuff? I did uh, Mio and Winter Set. I did The Rainmaker and The Rainmaker. And he said, because if you want to be an actor, you just go and be anything. Let other people believe you, not believe you, decide or not decide. Just go and do it with complete commitment and freedom. And I always remember that because I have, I tend to have a lot of negative thoughts from time to time. Show business does tend to be difficult, especially if you're an actor. And I am probably my worst critic. And I second guess myself and judge myself all the time. And I do think about that, that I can do anything. Whether they believe it or not is their job. 
My job is to do it and make it as believable for me. Sir. Can I change my answer? <laughs> That's what we still know that answer. Thank you, Patty. Is this on? Yeah. Is this thing on? Is it on? Yeah. I, uh, I got out of the Army and I went to uh, City College of New York, and um, I thought I was going to be a playwright, actually. I wasn't positive, but uh, then I took an acting as an elective one term, and um, there was a professor, I can't remember his name, who just really, really encouraged me and said, you should try and think about this as, as a career. And I, I, you know, I thought it was a joke that I think I'm like an actor living at it, but he took me aside and said, you should really think about this, you know, you have the talent to do it, I don't tell a lot of students, but you should really take a shot at it. So after I graduated, I really didn't, I, I kept writing and I got signed uh, as a screenwriter with a good agency in New York, a literary agent, before I ever got an acting agent, and then um, when I wouldn't um, change any of my writing, because at that time I wouldn't compromise at all. <laughs> And uh, the agent got fed up with me and said, if you're not going to change it, you know, none of these things are going to get produced. The producers would come in and talk to me, and I wouldn't change it. And I'd say, nah, I'll do it. So I, I decided to uh, act again. And then um, I remember that professor told me that I would make a living at it. And uh, I actually found to make a living at it. It's been good to me ever since, really. Thank you for that. My mother, for uh, a long story, to make it very short, just for instilling me with the courage to uh, get out there. The green ladies make your way up front. What are we buzzing about? I think they're cutting the lawn out. Hi guys, here. Is this on? Yeah, you're right. All right. I have a question for all of you. Uh, do you watch his performances? And if you do, what's your reaction to them? I thought I'd miss it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I watch them. And uh, I think I'm to the point now where I can sit there and be fairly critical and, uh, you know, and objective in my judgment. Uh, <clears throat> but at the same time, I see stuff and I hate it and I'm embarrassed. And I see stuff and I go, damn. Yeah. Yeah, I did good. Uh, I don't hide anymore. I don't cringe anymore. I couldn't in the beginning when I first started. I, I, I was too much too critical when I'd see myself on screen. And I just tear my performance apart. But as the years went on, I can watch it now, and I actually enjoy watching myself. I've gone from that you know, from that range, not being wanting to look at myself, to now I actually enjoy it. <laughs> Do you ever see a dog watching television? You know how like they don't relate to it. When I first came here from the theater and I saw myself on TV, I knew it was my voice because I recognized it. But I, it didn't seem like that was me to me. You know, I, I just, it was like a dog watching the TV. It made no sense to me. And uh, now I kind of, well, actually, I want to check out Mike's work. Because, uh, you didn't tell him about the shower scene. And, no. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of enjoy uh, watching myself. To be honest, with you. I, I kind of like it. It's, it's really interesting to me to see the way the director saw it. Because whenever I watch myself, I don't, I have a hard time seeing what's on the screen or on, uh, you know, on the television set. Because I remember doing it. I remember what it felt like doing it. I remember being there. But I, I don't know. I have no clue what it was going to ultimately look like. Cut together what it would be like in different uh, things. So uh, I kind of, uh, I enjoy it, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's fun. It's, it's a different point of view. It's a different angle. I was really curious about the Quantum Leap one because I couldn't visualize that one at all. I didn't have a clue because it was really weird to me, you know, because he was in a dress the whole time. And, he was, and I'm talking to him like he's my daughter. And, and I was very pleased. I thought it was very believable. It was, I very much enjoyed it. And uh, I was surprised and pleased by it. Um, yeah, like like the rest of the guys. I mean, I, when, I, when I first when I first started out, um, not not even first started out. After I did Quantum Leap, I got the, the tape of it, the cassette of it to watch. Um, 
I had it in my house for two months before I even started. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm serious. I mean, I, you know, because it's like, oh yeah, I was there. I know what the engine is, and you know, I know, I, I know what my things are. So you know, I don't, I don't need to see this. But as I, as I got more and more comfortable with the fact that this is a business, and if I'm going to have any kind of longevity, I better know what I do and don't do well. I started watching. And I decided that uh, grab the bus maybe ain't that bad. <laughs> you can change your answer now. I guess. Uh, uh, um, no, my answer my answer is the same as it was when the when the question was first asked, and that, and that is, uh, I still find it difficult to watch my work because I'm hypercritical of it. I just gotta go. What the hell are you doing with your idea? <laughs> That kind of thing, um, but it's it's get, it's it's no no it's but it's getting it's getting better. In fact, I kind of I I, I kind of like watching myself on Mad About You since that happens to be my favorite sitcom, uh, and uh, and so it was over and I was kind of pleased. I said, well, that wasn't too bad. Like, I think I was playing a hopeless guy, and how can you look really too bad? Like, and uh, and I was just feeling okay about it, and my mom called, and I, I said, hey, mom, and she said, hi, I saw you, you look like a dork. <laughs> so, I don't know if I'm the best or not, but... <laughs> you know, it's 20 to 5, and nobody told us what time we were supposed to finish up here. Not yet. <laughs> I can answer with that. There might be other people that are going to talk to you. Well, but, okay, green lady. <laughs> um, all of you seem to have really good senses of humor, and in, this, in three of the uh, episodes, you dealt with really serious subject matter. Um, were there things that you did on the set that sort of lightened things up during the downtime, or were you serious the whole time? Or is there any uh, good stories you can tell us that mm -hmm. happened that sort of, let, you know, sort of lightened things up, the pranks that you played on each other? Or, <laughs> Here's a great story about Black and White on Fire. Um, my character, uh, the Ron Taylor character, the big guy that, that dies, and, and Gregory, the, the other my other partner in crime. This is like this was like weird, just like day number three of filming and this very heavy stuff. And it was actually Scott's birthday that week, which kind of lightened up lightened up the week for us for at least a minute. You know? <laughs> We're sitting on the set one day, and we're about to, I'm, I'm about to grab Corey by the hair and get ready to blow her away. And it's a real intense scene, and we, we shoot the scene, and I'm like really depressed because, one, I don't like being women, and two, Corey was my friend. <laughs> um, we're sitting around, we're sitting around waiting for the next setup, and Ron starts to sing a song from Little Shop of Horrors. <laughs> you know, feed me, feed me. Now wait a minute, now wait a minute, here's the good part. Gregory joins in. I join in. We all kind of stop and look at each other. It turns out that Ron Taylor, the big guy, was the original voice of the plan. Oh. Oh. Right. Gregory did, did Little Shop of Horrors on the West Coast as the plan. I did the plan for your last day. We did we did decide that we would never work together again. Three plans. In in rape it was uh, Actually, the the, uh, the lady who played my mother and the two of the gals who were my daughters. Uh, we we all sort of uh, the McBain family hung together, and it was very. Um, huh? Your wife. He said your mother. What? Uh, uh, <laughs> I am in therapy currently. <laughs> of course, that's not the kind of therapy it is. It will be now. But we uh, we uh, it was very it was a, a very respectful set. It was. I would say somber, but that sort of feels like it was sad. It just we knew what we knew what the episode was about, and it was very. Uh, uh, we all were very close about it, and, and as a family, we kept sitting together during the breaks, and Scott would sit with us, and it was. Um, 
it was kind of uh, very restrained and we were very serious about uh, talking about the scenes in between, how we were going to do them, because we knew it was a very kind of important subject. And uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot of, a whole lot of laughs, except about this. <laughs> I can't believe they don't know what this is. Is this a quantum leap convention? Well, the first couple of rows you can see. That's a bookmark. Yes, it's a, it is a bookmark, but no, the pattern? It's Al's medals from his uniform. That's right. Oh. See, now that you said that, you can put it in the second row, and all of a sudden, it's gone. Wait, it says uh, there's another question going to be asked right now. <laughs> Oh, uh, in Temptation Eye, is that, um, I don't know, I can't remember all of it. <laughs> I, I, I stayed pretty much a character, I guess, you know, it was, uh, but. We don't have a whole battery of grips that. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know what we did on the breaks, I don't think there were a lot of kids around, really. <laughs> It was pretty much in character, and it was pretty intense, actually, as far as I recall. You know. And like I said, I didn't get to kill all the people I wanted to kill, so that's <laughs> frustrating, but... <laughs> oh, I, was in, I was in one that was funny, so, I mean, you know, there was nothing humorous there, because it was all funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other one, I, you know, I was, it was about the minor, and, uh... The Welsh mine. The Welsh mine. <laughs> Definitely not Irish. And uh, we sort of came in, did the scene, and we left. And uh, there was not a whole lot funny about that. <laughs> because the scene was far too complicated to be humorous. <laughs> Irishmen on a bus. <laughs> well, I'm sure, I mean, with, with five actors, I mean, if you get us started, we'll just tell you don't them. Yeah, I broke out of his hand one time in a play. Mike and I were doing a Mice and Men in St. Louis on, on stage. I was playing Lenny. I was, was playing Curly. Yeah. Right? And I couldn't play Curly. And, uh, in the scene where Curly breaks Lenny's, uh, Lenny breaks Curly's hand, you know, crushes his hand. We had it choreographed very specifically. You know, people would come and cover us, and Mike would stand on my thighs, and I'd lift him up by his hand, and Mike uh, broke my hand in that, in that scene. <laughs> it's the first time that Curly broke Lenny's hand. <laughs> Arthur, did, Arthur did half the run with a cast on his hand. So I was really in a cast. <laughs> in a cast. I'm sure if somebody thinks of something that they'd like to say, it's hysterical enough to point it out here. In the meantime, we'll go to the next green one. Somebody... <laughs> oh, green lady, please. Right. <laughs> okay, if anybody could leap, past or present. Say so what? Could leap into the past? Uh, if anybody could leap into the past or present, well, yes, the, the assumption past? is, where would you leap, or what would you leap into? And, uh, yeah, is the, is, more the future, is the future looking at for all of you? Uh, or? That depends on Dole and the Canon and people like that. <laughs> <laughs> somebody, somebody have a, a, a elite desire? <laughs> <laughs> Seven or eight years I lived in Granite City, Illinois. 
that would be somewhere. <laughs> that would be somewhere around uh, what between 1956 and about 1964-65. Uh, That's it. <laughs> I don't care. Future is what the future is. You know. I think I die. It's going to be fine. I'm sorry. I think I'd, I think I'd leap back to to Africa, to the shores of, of, of West Africa, and go. Unless you get one of those parts, but usually 
it's pretty well defined for you. This is the job, this is what you need to do. And then you try to find something within those little things that allows you to do something. Yeah, I was watching um, a Cable last night at Bravo. They did, they did a special on Louis Armstrong. And um, Wynton Marcellus had this to say, well, I think, I, I think Louis Armstrong was probably the greatest <coughs> contribution to American music that we've had in this country so far. And the interesting thing about that is that Louis Armstrong didn't play a lot of notes in terms of, you know, burning up the music, like say someone like, you know, Miles or Whitney Marcellus or someone like that. But because he played the nuances so simply and so well, it makes his music the hardest music to play. And I think the great thing about being an actor is to, is to find the nuance. So by the time by the time we get the job, the, the character's already been decided for us. Our job is to come in and make it sweet to your ears or, or you know, to make you, to fill in with nuance. All we do is throw a little color on the canvas. We, you know, we don't draw the pictures. I think that, that um, it's, it's what's inside you that you bring out and bring to the character that, that makes the difference. I mean, there's, you know, they'll see a hundred people in a day for the same Character and uh, it's. I, I think there's there are qualities in, inside you, even if even though you might suppress them, that you have to be able to let out. Like if, like for instance, if I were playing uh, uh, someone who murders someone, I don't like to think that that's the kind of person that I am. But there's that magic. If if I was that person in these circumstances, how would I act? How would I react? Um, and so you again, you take the words and you you make them your own and, and bring what you can to them and if that you know if that's attracted to the director and producers and so forth and you put the job if not you know playing homeless people in that value. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have time for two more questions. I'd like to know Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah this one for my new generation um, what other work have you done besides quantum link? I used to work at a steel mill. <laughs> I, worked in yeah. I mean, television and film. Oh! We got, right now I have a recurring role on ER. Uh, television, Family Matters, Reasonable Doubts uh, was on The Flash for the season that it was on. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, Star Trek Next Generation, Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Yeah, a few things, yeah. Do we have time for one more? Question. Yeah, right here. This is coming up for all of you. Hey, of all the Quantum Leap episodes that we have done in the past, I want to know which episode did you think was the best episode that we have done yet? And I want to you can't ask an actor that question. We're all going to say it's ours, but we can give a shot at it, Mike. Which episode did you think that was the best episode that we did? Yeah, we got that. Does anybody think it was something other than the one they yeah. were? Uh, don't get me wrong, uh, Disco Inferno, it was lovely. <laughs> I, I still have my leisure suit, but anyway, uh, I don't get into it anymore. Uh, no. I'd have to say the, uh, God, what is it called? Going home, coming home, the homecoming. Oh, 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 oh. I, that's, that's my favorite. Um, when Sam leaped into, I believe it was the South, and he had to defend this woman. He goes against, he goes against, he goes against. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. That's, the one. that's my favorite. I even know the title. Okay. It's hard from here. Uh, I heard Joel Larry and I, I heard <laughs> What about the Jimmy episode? <laughs> what about my episode that I have done? Oh. <laughs> oh, Jimmy was great, too. <laughs> Right up there, baby. That's neck and neck with 